sacramental images of Christ, who is, who is the sacramental image of, uh, of God. And to live the life of the triune God in the church, which is the image of Christ, that we're all called to be together collectively. And that we live that in our ministerial identities, uh, through our vocation, our call, how the Spirit calls us to be Christ for one another and for the world, to build up God's reign. So we looked at then how that, uh, what that means for the deacon who uh, images sacramentally Christ as servant, Christ the servant. And then we got into some of the nuts and bolts of um, um, different skills that are important in listening and assessing authentic needs uh, and in accompaniment. And now we're going to look this afternoon at a tool, this is a very concrete tool that exists in ministry uh, of all kinds. Um, in order to assess how we are, how our ministerial skills and different situations are developing, whether we, uh, you know, how we maybe, uh, how things went, and where they could go in the future to kind of help us to do better as we continue to grow. And this is the tool of theological reflection. Uh, who's done or at least heard of theological reflection? I'm sure in your training you must have had some, probably, right? Um, so tell us a little bit in terms of your own knowledge or just or what you think about it, like how would you understand theological reflection? Finding where God is in the situation. Yes, that's definitely key to it, right? Identifying where is God at work in a situation. So it's reflecting about that. It's reflecting prayerfully, obviously, guided by the Spirit. Um, often in communion and in, in conversation, right? There's also a communal uh, element to it very often. And um, I don't know how much you've already been given on it, but obviously we, there are different models of theological reflection, different books that have been written on it. Uh, and so what I have done here is to just give a very, you know, superficial kind of uh, treatment of it. And we're going to uh, work with it in a case study uh, and apply some of what we've been talking about. Now, the uh, model that I'm using here, as you'll see, is, uh, is where, where did the keyboard go? Here it is. Um, we're going to get into what the model is, but first let's look at what theological reflection is. Um, and this is, by the way, this quote, which already tells you where the model I'm using and what it's based on, is for, uh, the, the Whiteheads, who are, uh, you know, wrote one of the um, who wrote the art of spiritual direct? Uh, sorry, the art of theological reflection, which is um, a very respected book on theological reflection. And according to, to um, the Whiteheads, theological reflection quote is the discipline of exploring individual and corporate experience in conversation with the wisdom of a religious heritage. So before going on with the rest of uh, their definition. We're exploring both individual and corporate experience. And we're exploring experience, which itself is significant. Okay? So it isn't just obviously about, because it's pastoral, it isn't simply about taking what does the, the religious tradition have to say about X, Y, or Z. I mean, that obviously enters into it. It's very important. But it's also looking at putting that in conversation, the wisdom of our tradition, puts it in conversation with our experience and the, the uh, application, right? And it's not just my individual experience as a minister, it's also the experience uh, of the communities that have formed me and also that I met people that I minister with and so forth. Now this conversation is a genuine dialogue that seeks to hear, according to the Whiteheads, that seeks to hear from our own beliefs, actions, and perspectives as well as those of the tradition. It respects the integrity of both. Theological reflection, therefore, may confirm, challenge, clarify, and expand our understanding of our own experience and how we understand the religious tradition. The outcome is new truth and meaning for women. And this is from, actually, sorry, this is not from the Whiteheads. Uh, this is from Killen and DeBeer, who they, are, they have a different uh, model um, of spiritual direction. So Killen and De Beer, their method in the, in the art of spiritual direction, they offer this uh, definition of spiritual direction. Uh, but what these approaches have in common 
these different approaches is that it's they're very what we call in theology correlational, meaning that you you put it's a conversation, it's a dialogue between different um, elements, you know, personal experience, culture, communal experience, the religious tradition, and these things are correlated with each other in order to come to a deeper wisdom, right? Uh, and so that is what we will be doing. Uh, and applying it to very concrete scenarios that we may encounter when we are uh, accompanying someone pastorally. So, what are some of the pastoral tools that theological reflection offers us? So, uh, in theological reflection, as uh, you probably already know, we always begin with a ministerial experience. So we start, obviously, with... Um, what we might call a case study, which is a sort of where we put out, we kind of in an organized way, we just we, we narrate what it is that happened, who the actors were, um, what happened, what was going on, and so forth, what were the, maybe the conflicts or the needs that came up, and so on. We go to a ministerial experience, and then um, we reflect on that in dialogue with, obviously, the religious tradition. So that includes sacred scripture, uh, the uh, tradition, the, the, the discipline of theology, the liturgy, lives of the saints, etc. Anything from the religious tradition that can help, in our case, our Catholic Christian religious tradition, that can help us with 2,000 years of accrued wisdom, right? So this is very important, and some of the things that we look at here, it, it's, there's a quality of reflection that I think is very important here. Um, when you're thinking about someone you spoke to who is, uh, you know, whose kids uh, are having uh, 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 problems at school and who they don't know how to handle it, and they're maybe coming to you because they want to unburden and talk about it or whatever, you're probably thinking, well, what does the liturgy have to do with that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Now, maybe in that, in that instance, you may or may not turn to that part of the religious tradition to address it. But what we try to do here is to so expand our understanding of how these things connect to one another that you'd be surprised. Sometimes that can actually have something to say to us, right? Because what we remember is that we have a tradition that uh, we believe the Holy Spirit breathes and speaks through the whole tradition of the church. It's not only from, in terms of the magisterial teachings, it's also through the prayer of the church, the life of the church, like the liturgy, right? Um, very often there is great wisdom, let's say in liturgical texts, that when we listen to it, or in, for example, the liturgical seasons, you know, you can reflect prayerfully on, let's say, the relationship between Lent and Easter, Right? or between Easter and Pentecost, now that we're coming up on Pentecost tomorrow. And that prayerful reflection, uh, supported by your experience of the church praying together those mysteries of the liturgy, can actually inform and inspire and be a portal for the Spirit to speak to you in terms of how you speak to that parent who's having that issue with that child. Right? So it, it, all of these things. And of course, lives of the saints, that's a more obvious connection, because you look at obviously the example of life, right? And how some of them may have had similar challenges to the person you're turning to and so on. Sacred art, right? Sacred scripture, obviously the Bible and so on. But this dialogue is not only the ministerial experience that, uh, with the religious tradition, it also takes into account other formative, impactful elements such as culture. Uh, and so, Literature and the arts, the social sciences, cultural values, the collective wisdom of a community and its culture, etc. Okay, so there might be um, you might think of uh, a hero of yours from a novel that you read, and it may not even be religious, right? It might be something that you read that speaks to you that has a lot of wisdom in it, and it may not even be Christian or even theistic or anything, but it has something to say, and so you say, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks through many different avenues, and that might inform in some way your, and enrich and deepen your reflection on this ministerial situation, okay? 
personal experience. Okay, everything, all of these things are filtered through our personal experience, right? Um, and if you don't believe me, look at something like sacred scripture or the liturgy and look at the difference between how one person experiences those things and interprets them in light of what, how they have their relationships and their experience growing up in the church versus someone else, you know? Somebody might, who grew up in a very, um, with, with very um, sort of punishing image of God, maybe in a very restrictive, very, uh, you know, family where it was where God was this this big ogre, their experience of the liturgy, and also depending on who the priest was when they went to church and what it was like parish life when they were growing up, they might walk into the liturgy and experience something very sort of restrictive and prohibitive and very like that actually uh, unsettles them from their sense of trusting in God. Whereas somebody else, that same liturgy, they, it, it helps them to ground and to connect to God more deeply and to trusting in God, right? And the quality of our reflection is important because our own experience, our personal experience, can change. So for, I'll give you a, a good example of this. I remember when I started studying theology, that um, there were certain scripture, parts of scripture that I, and I'm sure this is true of a lot of us, right? There were certain parts of scripture that I absolutely adored. If you gave me a Bible to open up and reflect on something, I knew where I wanted to go. It was basically the Gospels and the Psalms, okay? You know, it's like we're Proverbs or something like that, right? Just beautiful, it would always speak to me, you know, and at the Gospels, you know, the compassionate words and actions of Jesus, and da da da, and so on. But there were other areas of Scripture that were like minefields for me. They were very difficult for me to read. You know, like some of the, the uh, parts of the prophets, for example, that seem to be like, you know, Jeremiah. Like Jeremiah, exactly. Lamentations. Just like what lamentations, oh, exactly. Is. Things that you're like, oh my God, you know, God is going to just <laughs> come down on us like a, you know, like a two by four or something. You know. And I used to have those, and if I opened at random and I landed on one of those passages, it was difficult for me to read. I couldn't really, almost like I couldn't trust God, right? But as I studied theology, as I learned about Scripture, and I started understanding more about how those, the history of the writing of the Bible and, and what the context of those authors were and why they wrote like that, and also tying it to the liturgy, how we use the text of the liturgy, and really understanding how the, the, what the mind of the church says about all of those things, I experienced a genuine transformation of my relationship with Scripture. So that I don't have, right at this point, my relationship to those passages that before I used to find very troublesome, I actually find solace, and it's like the opposite. <laughs> because I read them, they're like totally different for me now. So what happened? My personal experience changed, okay, based on a deeper engagement with the tradition of the church and with the people in the community of the church and positive relationships and the way that all of that came together. So personal experience is extremely important. So now, uh, and this already we've gone into a little bit, why does theological reflection take into account my personal experience? And this is worth asking because um, some people might think, well, what matters here is what the tradition has to say. And what are the concrete nuts and bolts of the situation? What are, you know, it's not about you, it's not about your personal experience. But, again, we are the filter through which all of those things passes. Just like we were talking before about you've got to know your transference and your countertransference. How are people responding to you that you're ministering to, and how are you responding to them? Why are you feeling the things you're feeling? That's tapping into your experience to help you to separate things out and be able to really help someone and not hurt them, right? So with personal experience, um, first of all, from a theological perspective, we remember that the Christian tradition is rooted, it's all about the mystery of the Incarnation. Our primary place of understanding who God is, as Christians, is Jesus Christ. It's the divine human person of Jesus Christ. Which means, 
that God has chosen to self-reveal in and through the particular, in and through the limitations of being a creature. God chose to become mm -hmm. this limited human creature, while not jeopardizing or diminishing in any way his divinity and its infinite, his infinite uh, divine nature. You know, the humanity, we know from the classical definition, right, the Council of Chalcedon, the, the divinity in no way uh, violates his humanity, and his humanity in no way diminishes his divinity, right? There's two, two natures, one divine person. But what that means is that we find the fullness of who God is in that limited context of a unique personal experience, a personal encounter through Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we see reveal the face of God. So we're already seeing that uh, in Christian spirituality, we're constantly being asked as church and as members of the body of Christ, how is God calling us, the church, me as a member of the body, here and now, in and through my present circumstances? We're always asking that, being asked that question. The Holy Spirit is always, through our circumstances, through our experience, collective and personal, to respond to something, you know? And so we experience, again, as a church and also as members of the body, as individuals uh, who are members of the church, we have these, we, we have uh, the signs of the times, the things that are happening to us, whether it's stuff that's happening in the world, in the headlines, and, and then maybe we feel a call to respond to that as a church or as a parish community, or also just on an individual level, you know? Uh, I have my ministry, I have this and that, and I have a certain uh, range of family problems, right? Uh, I have my relationships, I have my friendships, I have my, my community life with my brothers and so on. And those are personal experiential realities that constantly is the place where Christ is being incarnated, where the Holy Spirit is constantly calling me to become more like Jesus, right? So personal experience is, is quite important, as long as you know, we don't make a God out of it or something. You know, it's not about, it isn't about us, it's ultimately about God and about the kingdom of God. But you can't leave out personal experience. It's, it's, one, of, it's one of the primary vehicles through which each of us you know, experiences that. Um, another thing we need to remember, this goes back to transference and countertransference. Experience is one of the lenses through which we interpret the world. Okay? Our past experiences and our relationships and everything else inform what we think stuff means. You know, if you say good morning to me, or if you don't say good morning to me, I automatically have an interpretation. <laughs> mm -hmm. It may not merit an interpretation. Maybe you didn't see me. Maybe you didn't hear me when I said good morning. But if you don't respond, automatically I'm interpreting. Why? Based on my experience, you know? If I'm overly sensitive because I'm always feeling abandoned or ignored by people, I might think, oh my God, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? What, you know, where did I get them angry? Did I, you know what I mean? Um, so we need to know that. So this is important because what me, that means is that our, our experience is both a valuable pastoral tool, but it can also be a challenging obstacle if I'm not aware of it. So that insight it can be a great pastoral tool. How? Well, once I feel those feelings, I'm aware of it, and if I separate myself and say, you know what, I don't know what's going through her head. I don't know why she didn't say good morning. Maybe she didn't hear me. Or maybe she's going through a rough time. And maybe she just doesn't want to be bothered with anybody, but it's not really about me. You know what I mean? And then I'm able to kind of, then, if I'm in a pastoral situation, a ministerial situation, I can turn that to an advantage. I can maybe, instead of responding like, wow, or giving the silent treatment, I could turn around and say, at an appropriate time, hey, are you okay? You know, it's, you know, you know, just checking in, you know. Or it could be simply that, um, you know, someone comes to me with that problem, and I've experienced it, and I can, you know, I don't have to go into detail, I don't need to share, like, the details of my life with that person, but because I've experience something similar, I might have an insight about it, you know, that I might be able to cautiously share, you know. Um, 
So it can be a pastoral tool. It can help me. It can help me kind of navigate how to help someone. But if I'm not aware of it, or if it's uh, unconsciously, um, you know, um, misappropriated, I could it could become an obstacle in my ability to help people. And finally, being self-aware is really important for enhancing our ability to be more fully present to the persons and communities we serve, while helping us, like I said, to get out of the way of our ministry to them. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing is that if you look at the writings of the great mystics, of people like Teresa of Avila, for example, right? they're not self-absorbed, but they're aware of self. Again, not in a narcissistic way, but they are aware of self. Again, it's ultimately oriented toward God. That's how you know the difference, right? It's ultimately oriented toward facilitating greater cooperation with God's will for us to be united to Him, right? But they're very aware of their creaturely nature, of their vices and their faults, as well as their virtues. Um, and they're able to hold both those things in tension and accept themselves in a certain way, you know? Like, yeah, I know I have a lot of bad habits, and I know that, you know, I get in the way a lot. I also know that it's up to God to help me get over that. <laughs> you know, I don't need to beat myself up with a whip, you know, over something like that, because I know, now I know I need to cooperate with grace, Right? To, 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 you know, but I also know that I need to be patient and accept myself where I am now. There's, you see that wisdom present in, in, some, in some of these people. They have a, a keen psychological awareness, again, always in the service of their union with God. It's always really about God. It's like the opposite of pride. They have the humility to know where they are in the world. Yes, exactly. And the humility is not just about, oh, I'm a speck lower than, you know. They'll say things like that, but they, like there was, I remember I was reading St. Teresa, and she said something that caught my attention. I think it was in the interior castle, if I remember correctly, but um, I remember her saying something to the effect of, in one part, she's talking about how, yes, how she, small she is, that she's less than a speck, and that she's so insignificant. And then shortly after, or before or something, she's talking about how immense the dignity that God has given her, and how great she, you know, how great we are. It's like she's able to hold both of those things together without contradiction, you know? That in one sense, we're less than nothing, and yet in another sense, we're like gods, you know? <laughs> you know, so, because we're made in the image of God, right? Um, so anyhow, this is important, that we have a healthy, balanced, and God-centered awareness of self and of our uh, experience that we can put uh, in the service of union with God and service of one another. So, going to the models we were talking about before, there are various different models, let me make this more visible, various different models of theological reflection. Now, these are two of the best known. One of them is Killen and De Beer, which whom we quoted earlier, uh, developed by Patricia uh, O'Connell Killen and John De Beer. Now, the other model is the Whitehead Method, developed that I mentioned before, and I mistakenly attributed to, uh, uh, the quote to, to uh, and that's James and Evelyn Whitehead. Now, they're different. Different models of, of uh, theological reflection have served different purposes. So depending on what you're trying to do, you might be better off doing one than, than the other. Um, Killen and De Beer is not about problem solving. Okay? Killen and De Beer is purely about seeking a deeper understanding of whatever the pastoral situation is. You just want to have more insight. But it's open-ended. You're not necessarily trying to find a solution. Or, you know, how do I act differently going forward? That's not what it's about. That's more in the Whitehead method, okay, which is more what we're going to do, okay, or at least based on it. It's based, what we're going to do is based more on the Whitehead method. Um, is oriented toward discerning an appropriate pastoral response. So, not that you're going to solve things, but it is more in that direction of how do I address this? How could I do better going forward? What worked? What could work better? Okay? So I, I see these two and in my profession one of the first things they teach us when we have something go wrong is the first approach. And right. we call it winding the clock. Right. And so something bad's happened and your initial reaction is to start moving switches and shutting down engines and going to divert fields but they want us just to wind our clock. Mm -hmm. and get a deeper understanding of what exactly is going on. Right. 
before you do that. Exactly. And truthfully, there is some of that in the Whitehead method. It's not that the Whitehead method is trying to go and solve a problem and not. Obviously, theological reflection always involves theological reflecting. Mm -hmm. You know, you are going to go deeper into it a little bit and understand more. That's why you have the conversation with culture and with the tradition and with your experience and so on. Um, it's just that some approaches are more content to kind of stay there and just have a deeper understanding um, and just let it be there. And then, of course, that should gradually inform your ministry, right? And, and because you have greater awareness. But other approaches are more uh, about, okay, now what do we do with that? You know, like that's actually part of the method. It's integrated into the method, which is sort of um, what we're going to try to do a little bit here. And again, it's even that, it's not like a problem solving. That's not what we're trying to do so much. Um, but it is about discerning how can we, do, how could we respond better pastorally in the future. So there, there was a movie out that came out recently called The Best of Enemies. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it seems like they use a method. To, so this is my question. Yeah. Do you, did theological reflection come out of the Christian experience and filter into, into the, the, you know, the political, whatever, communal environment, mm -hmm. or the other way around? It's probably a little bit of both. I mean, in terms, in the sense that, in, okay, so, I mean, that's a big question. I can tell you that in theology, um, one of the things that, that happens in contemporary theology is that there is this movement toward, um, you know, you have this divide between sort of very classically between very speculative, you know, like what's the internal workings of the Trinity and things like that, you know, what is a sacrament. And, um, but theology is also very pastoral. So there's things like back in the old days, say before Vatican II, were like the manualist tradition. You know, like you're going to hear a confession, how do you know how to address a particular pastoral need of someone when they confess a certain sin, and how do you address that, and so on. Um, one of the things that's happened, I think, is that in, certainly in the 20th century, not only theology, but other fields as well, uh, particularly fields that have to do with working with people and helping people, have tried to have uh, more of an integration of the speculative and the practical. You know, you see that reflected in even the degrees that you can get. So, for example, if you're um, going to get a theology degree, if you're going to get a doctorate, you can get a PhD in theology, which could be past. You could get a PhD in pastoral theology, but um, you you know you also can get a doctorate of ministry, a DMIN, right? Which is you know the emphasis is going to be definitely much more pastoral, right? So, in a DMIN program, you might be doing you know, there might be more things like this and case studies and things, you know, not that you might not be exposed to that if you're, you know, depending on what you're doing a PhD, but you could do a PhD on, again, the, the history of Trinitarian theology, you know, in, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you know, in, in the Middle Ages or something, you know what I mean? So there's a way in which I think that um, in the 20th century, certainly, there's been a, a, a desire to kind of you know, to integrate and to bring sort of um, people's knowledge of theology, their study of theology and so forth, and make it very applied to pastoral situations. And also that theology is not something, uh, or any academic discipline, that it's not something that occurs in a vacuum, that there's this supposed total objectivity. Like my questions and my experience have no bearing on this objective knowledge. But rather that what I can know partly has to do with the kinds of questions I'll ask, and the kinds of questions I'll ask have to do with my experience and why I think that's an important question to ask, right? Um, so anyhow, I don't know, it's probably going a little beyond the scope of, of what you're asking, but I think that the, um, there's probably... Um, you know, especially in, 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 in uh, pastoral forms of theology, there's a, uh, as it, it moves more in that direction, uh, you know, we, we're in a time where you want to look at context. You, know, you want to look at not just what the religious tradition says in isolation, but how does that connect to the people's living out of it. And so that will take into account your social location, you know, your gender, 
your, you know, your life experience, your culture, and, and so forth. Okay, so I don't know if that helps or if that, yeah, you know. Um, so um, here we have. I just wanted to include some pictures of the people that we're talking about. So here we have Killen and De Beers. Killen and De Beer, rather. And these are Evelyn and James Whitehead, who, as you can tell, are married, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hence the same last right. name. Um, and so that tells you a little bit about, uh, that's what, you know, in terms of theological reflection. Now, having had that little introduction, what we're going to do now is work on a case study. So if you could, um, have that ready, okay, the case study, if you could just pull that up. And before we go into actually reading the case study, let me just very quickly give me one second. There is also a handout that you should have there. And I have it here. I'm just trying to let me pull it up in my notes. Okay, let's see. Okay, it's not there. All right, that's wrong. Is it the voices? Yes, it's the voices. And I don't know why I'm not seeing it here. Could be below. Oh. It's not below in the uh, case study. Now, uh, let's see where would I have put that. Here it is. Okay. So uh, here it is. So basically, I just wanted to give you a little primer first on what we're going to be doing. This is based on the, the Evelyn and James Whitehead model. We used to do something like this when I was at our uh, our seminary, you know, our theological school. Um, in St. Louis, the Minas Institute of Theology. Uh, it wasn't exactly like this, but it was very close. I based it off of that. And it's again, it's based on the Whitehead method, or the Whitehead model. And so what's going to happen is there's, uh, so let me explain. Basically, you have a group of ministers, okay, which is us, <laughs> and then somebody presents a case, something that uh, happened, that they experienced, uh, and that they want, I guess, further clarity on or some further discernment with the wisdom, help the wisdom of, the, of that community of ministers. This is a lovely model that you can utilize. Um, for example, if you have, it's a good way also for deacons in different parts of the diocese who have trained together to continue to reconnect. Because if you wanted to, you could do this on a regular basis, uh, maybe once a month if you wanted to, and you could maybe get together for dinner and whatnot, or you know, have a theological reflection group if you wanted to. And you could maybe uh, have your, you know, everybody, the deacons and the wives if you wanted to, uh, and maybe reflect, okay? So basically what you do is, this is a great tool for continuing to improve in your pastoral skills, continuing to get better at it, right? Uh, and to really be sensitive and listen to the spirit. So what you would do is, you would do a short write-up of the case study, or whatever it is that you're presenting. That write-up would be, uh, strictly speaking, you're just giving the facts, uh, change names, obviously. You do not use real names. You try to make it, um, you know, impossible to identify, okay? And you would basically, um, you know, change any identifying information. And what you do is you present, uh, you know, somebody presents the case, and you would include details about, for example, just factual details, uh, and how you felt and what you observed, okay? Uh, because all of that is grist for the mill here, right? And what you do in the beginning is you have a facilitator as well as a presenter. So one of you would be the facilitator, meaning you would lead the session. You would make sure that it stays on time so that you don't go over your time and that uh, you know it's not burdensome in that way and that you get to the point and so forth. So the facilitator 
would begin by asking the presenter, the person presenting the case. In this case, I prepared a case study of something that I experienced several years ago when I was still in initial formation with the Dominicans. Okay? Um, again, without any identifying information. The facilitator would ask the presenter, in this case me, they would ask me to read the case. Okay? This part is about five minutes tops. Okay, the person reads their case. No questions are offered at this stage. No evalu evaluation statements, oh, good job, or I would have done this different. None of that. This is just simply just the facts, okay? Like, like uh, Dragnet, just the Joe facts. Friday. <laughs> like Joe Friday, exactly. All right? Next, the facilitator then says, okay, now we're going to move on to some clarifying questions. So the facilitator at each step is going to just guide the group through that. That'll be five to ten minutes tops, okay? And it's just the point where maybe some things were not clear in the case study. Maybe, you know, Rocio might think, hmm, I wonder, there's something that's not, but I want to know it because I think it might be helpful to me to get more clarity. So she might say, well, what about, how old was that person, or whatever, right? And then those questions would be answered. After, like I said, 10 minutes tops, the facilitator moves on to initial reactions. So that's about seven minutes tops. They say, the facilitator says, okay, please share now any feelings or images that came up for you during the case presentation. Now, feelings and images, what that means is you would share if, let's say that when uh, a particular part of the case study was being read, you felt anxiety, right? or you felt a sense of happiness, or you felt sad, or you felt angry, whatever, you would share that. And images that come to mind. This is kind of engaging the imagination. You're using all of your experience, right? So it could be that someone was talking about, uh, I don't know, they were talking about uh, a bunch of kids' first communion or something, right? And maybe you kept having this heavy image in your head of like, I don't know, like a a chalice with a host floating over it. I'm just pulling that out of my hat, but you know, you get the picture. You know, just images that come to you. So it's feelings and images, okay? Um, after about seven minutes of that, the facilitator firmly but gently moves on and says, okay, now let's move on to issues and tensions in the case. So what that is, is that each participant will then be invited to share what are the issues here? What are the ministerial issues that you identify? Because sometimes you might have different ideas about what that is, right? And also tensions. So by tensions, what that means is it could be that there are things that are in tension with each other here. Like maybe is there a dual role situation, okay? Uh, is the, the person presenting the case uh, going to face a conflict that um, they're being asked, maybe the person in the parish who's approaching them is also like their best friend. Okay? That could be a tension. Okay? Um, or something like that. Or the person shared that they're hearing about someone having marital troubles and they themselves are having marital troubles and that makes them not know how to respond. Well, that could be another tension. Okay? And then the issue would be, well, that person has a marital trouble or, you know, whatever the issues are. Okay? After about seven minutes of that, we move to a really important piece, the heart of the matter. So the heart of the matter, the facilitator says, okay, what is the heart of the matter? This is where each participant has to name one thing that they believe for themselves, that they were in that, that they think, this is like the heart of the matter. This is the core issue. It doesn't mean that there aren't others. Of course there could be more than one issue. But what do you think is the most immediately pressing thing that needs to be attended to here? Okay? What is the heart of the matter? And identify that. Okay? So everybody's going to do that. That's going to be about two minutes. That's going to be pretty short. Next, the facilitator will facilitate uh, the discussion and reflection piece. Now, this is the longest piece. This could run anywhere from 24 to 30 minutes. Okay? Now, what does that look like? Each member of the group will be assigned by the facilitator what's called a voice, okay? And the voice is going to be, there are three voices that we're going to hear from. There's the voice of tradition, there's the voice of culture, 
and there's the voice of personal experience. Those three things that we were saying were put in conversation with each other in a theological reflection. Each participant is assigned this by the facilitator and must then speak from that perspective. So let's say that Tom is assigned the voice of personal experience and that Melissa is assigned the voice of tradition. So Melissa might think, okay, what in the religious tradition can I draw from to bring wisdom to this? She might think of the life of a saint, let's say, that's particularly relevant here, and she might share that. Tom, because his is the voice of experience, he might remember something that uh, he remembers uh, when he was 10 years old that he might think is germane, you know, to share that has wisdom to impart, to, to speak to the situation, and so on. All right, voice of culture. Could be, and and there, there's a sheet that you'll have that has examples of what could constitute voice of culture, voice of tradition, and voice of experience. We'll go to that in a minute. Actually, let's go to it now. So these are hardly exhaustive, but they sort of give the they give you the general idea. So the voice of tradition could be an example from it could be a scripture verse, it could be a life of a saint, it could be something about the liturgy, about the church's worship. It could be something about sacraments. It could be something from theology, a theologian that you've read. It could be something even from canon law. It could be something about religious orders. You know, like I might think of something from my Dominican charism that might be relevant here. Okay, um, something from the catechism of the Catholic Church, or it could be uh, some episode in church history you heard about once in your studies. You know, that might be could be a papal encyclical, or it could just be the you know prayer, right? The, the Christian prayer. Culture, obviously, it could be ethnicity or national background. Uh, it, it could be race. It could be uh, languages. Okay, it could be literature, social sciences, the wisdom of the social sciences to speak to something. You know, um, if you have a situation with, uh, for example, a couple that might be having issues in their marriage over something, or they might be on the verge of divorce, you might look at what do the social sciences have to say about that conflict or that question, right? Um, you know, uh, psychology, another one, history, art, music. Maybe there's a song, there's a pop song that comes, it pops into your head that might have wisdom, you know? Uh, poetry, film, TV, the news, you know, current events, the internet, politics, you get, you get the picture. And then, of course, personal experience. That's very comprehensive. That could be your upbringing, family life, your friends, childhood experiences, your talents, you know, you're, you're good at math, <laughs> whatever, um, your job, uh, religious or spiritual experience, right? You know, uh, memories, uh, health, education, different anecdotes, okay? So if you're, you could use any of those in whatever voice you're assigned. Now once that or that's the longest one. It could be up to a half hour or more. Uh, it could be shorter than that. Obviously, we're not a big group, so it's probably not going to be that long for our case study. But the final thing would be ministerial action. This is where we're going to how are, now how are, how is the presenter? This is this one is squarely on the presenter, not anybody else. The facilitator now turns to the presenter and says, you know, and, uh, to them. Okay, you've heard the group's input, you've heard the collective wisdom from these voices and, and everything. What's the takeaway for you? You know, what do you feel the spirit moving you? How do you think that you could, going forward, that uh, your praxis might be renewed or, you know, uh, have a better response or whatever? Or not, you know, or maybe it wasn't helpful, you know, whatever. Um, and then for about two minutes, the, the presenter will share that with the group, crystallize it through sharing it, and then we're done, okay? So this is something that uh, we're gonna do now. So what I'm gonna ask now is that we go now to the case study. If I can close this to go back to the study. So now, since I am the presenter, who wants uh, input from you all. Uh, I'm going to ask and see who, who do you think, who would like to be the facilitator? You want to go for it? All right. Okay. So I'm going to sit down. 
because I'm part of the group and I'm just presenting. And uh, you just go up there, you can lead, and just be mindful of time. According to the, the, sh the other sheet, that tells you more or less how many minutes tops, right? And if, if need be, I can step in and help you or whatever, but I'll try to avoid that if, if I can. All right, you're the presenter, so you're supposed to read. Gotcha. So can I call? I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, I got it. I got it. Thank you. Years ago, when I was a student brother preparing for ordination to the transitional diaconate and the priesthood, I spent a summer ministering at Children's Hospital in Dallas as part of the Clinical Pastoral Education, or CPE, program for hospital chaplains and seminarians. One day, I was asked to perform an emergency baptism for a newborn baby girl who was about to die. The little girl was one of a set of twins, and her sister was in perfect health. The twins' mother was visibly anguished as she sat in a wheelchair, her husband looking stoic and emotionless as he sat by her side, perhaps trying to be strong for his wife. The mother's sister and brother-in-law were by their side. As soon as I introduced myself to the parents, the mother began to shake her head and cry. I don't understand why this is happening. It was all so fast, so unexpected. As she continued speaking, she became increasingly tearful and angry. The problem is that even though I don't want to, <clears throat> I feel so disgusted with God. At this point, her voice broke into sobs. We knew by the sixth month that something was wrong, but I never thought. I thought God was going to take care of her and that she'd be born healthy. Her tears gave way to rage. Quote, I was so strong in my faith that God would save her. Why did God take her away from me? Why? What could she have possibly done for him to take her from me? I trusted God, and now I'm so angry at him. All right, thanks for reading that. So uh, after hearing all that, do any of you guys have any questions that, that you might uh, want to ask to clarify and to uh, bring some light on this uh, issue? Jeff? Then, do you know who asked for the baptism? So um, at the time, we were each assigned like different parts of the hospital. And that wasn't my part of the, uh, what I was at that, that day. What happened was that the chaplain who, in our team, who was normally assigned there, didn't speak Spanish. The person spoke Spanish and needed someone Spanish speaking. So uh, that person came to me and said, could you do this? And, that, and, that's, and, uh, and they were going to withdraw. They were going to withdraw life support because there was no, you know, so they, they needed the, the emergency baptism. But you don't know if it was the mother or the father or oh, I see the what aunt that was there? I don't remember which of them did. I, I, I suppose, I'm thinking that the chaplain probably offered it as an option, that look, this is, we can do this, and they, they consented, they said, yes, we want that. Okay. So, <clears throat> my, go ahead. Oh, sorry. My question is, uh, could you tell if the, uh, the, the desire for the baptism, was that done with reluctance, or was that done enthusiastically? It was, I mean, neither. It wasn't like enthusiastic, but it was, they definitely wanted the baptism. Okay. Oh, yeah. Do you know if the mom was in a wheelchair because she just gave birth? Yes. Yes, absolutely. What did you say, Jeremy? Sorry. Was the mom in a wheelchair because she just gave birth, or was it something else? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So was the baptism actually performed? Yes. So having known six months in hand that there was a warning, was the warning that this was inevitable, that you were going to possibly have to go through the... Yes, what kind of warning child? was it? So the warning was, it wasn't that we were warned. What happened was that the doctor, they knew when she was six months, as I recall, they knew when she was six months pregnant that something was wrong. But I don't know that they knew that the child wouldn't survive. It seemed that they just knew, okay, there's a problem with your pregnancy, we need to take some measures or whatever, and then it just went the way that no one wants it to go, kind of was what happened. Was this their, was this their first children? I don't recall exactly. That's an excellent question. I don't remember. I don't recall. There were no other children present that I can recall, so it may have been their first. Uh, it may have been. Okay, so uh, we've heard a little bit of this, some clarifying questions. 
Now, what's your initial reaction? Let's go around the group and tell me what's the first thing you thought about after you finished listening to this and hearing the uh, clarifying questions? Jeremy? What's the context of that question? Like, what's an example? So it would be like, um, it's really more about your visceral reaction to it. So what were the emotions that came up for you as you were hearing it? And then also, any images that came to your mind? just pop spontaneously into your head. Um, my own kid's birth came to my mind. Mm -hmm. And I can 100% relate. I could see myself being initially very angry too. Mm -hmm. So that was my initial reaction. I, I was, my initial reaction was I was sad for the mom that she was angry at that, at that, mm -hmm. in that moment. Robert, what do you think? What was your initial reaction? That the Bible's full of <laughs> lamentations. Mm -hmm. You know, this is reality. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Sarah? I would say when Melissa and the mom, my initial would be anger. Angry with God. All right. You've trusted me to have this child and you're not taking it away. Jeff, what were your thoughts? Um, I guess I was wondering, and maybe this is reading too much into it, but it said it was all so fast. But then she said that, they said that there might be a problem. Mm -hmm. So why is it like all a surprise to her all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. well, why were you unprepared for the, the, yeah, for the negative thinking, possibility? Maybe some denial there that she had along the way that, that there was a problem. And, and here, I just want to quickly interject. You're, that's good, but what you want to also do is focus it on your feeling. Be aware of your feelings. So I would attach that to an emotion. What emotion did thinking that bring for you? Uh, it's, it's, uh, just, I don't know, skepticism, if that's an emotion. Was it like, were you mad at her for, like, how could you not yeah. have the common yeah, sense? Maybe. To... Yeah, okay. It's like you were told, what, why is this a surprise? Right, right. So some anger. Hey, Tom, did you have any feelings? Now I feel bad that I wasn't more yeah. sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to name that. But that's important to name. That's the point of it. So that's good. Uh, anxiety. I, I was called something similar, but the baby had already been born. Mm -hmm. was still born. And I was on call to come. You know, the late Baptist. Like, they were Hispanic, didn't speak much English. They recognized that I, I just wasn't quite sure what to do. So anxiety. I baptized, but yeah. So. Understandable, but that also I wonder the relationship with the wife and the dad. And did the dad ever? Um, I felt I felt there was somewhat sadness here because there seemed to be a little disconnect, and maybe that's how he showed his emotion when he just didn't know what to do. But I almost sensed in some way some sadness here that she was so distraught and he was in his own world as well. That's how probably he helped, helped or he dealt with it. But it could have been that there was some other tension going on there, which didn't help. So, uh, remember your feeling. Feeling. Uh, sadness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anxiety and sadness. I mean, so, am I allowed to do my initial reaction also? Mm -hmm. So, my initial reaction is uh, frustration. Uh, frustration in the father being stoic. He might have been stoic at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And so, I sense that. So, uh, Chris, sorry. May I? Sure. I just wanted, can I ask one more question? Back up, or is that clarifying yeah. question? Yes. Yeah. No. Normally, we'll say yes, but normally when you're doing this, I think you try to kind of limit it to whatever. But ask it. Look at. I just wondered, did they have a specific faith background, trying to get a grip on this God that she might be angry at? With a, a specific religious background? Yes. Maybe? They were Catholic. They were definitely Catholic. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've gone around and we've got some initial reactions. What are some of the issues? The main issues we need to think about right now. What are the tensions that are? You know, balancing between the two tensions, right? And remember, there's issues and tensions. They're two things, right? Tom, what are you thinking? There, there may not be tensions. There may just yeah, be issues. Yeah, I, I don't, don't quite, yeah, I'm new to this, so I'm sort of struggling. The obvious issue, the sudden loss of a child, mm -hmm. when, you, when you have a healthy twin born with it, I'm not quite sure how to answer this. It's yeah, like, the yeah, joy and the pain. Between the wife and the father for some reason. I'm sort of zeroing in on this. I'm not sure why it is, but I don't know how to answer some of this stuff. So joy and pain, the tension, healthy child. The and tension that. between the healthy and deathly. There's a definite tension. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Melissa, can you think of something? I, I don't know. We want to also. I'm sorry. No, no. I was just going to say it's good for each person one at a time to kind of just so that everybody oh. has a chance to. So just, just wanted to say that. So I can see like the issue and the tension. Like you want to be like she said she doesn't want to be angry with God, but she's angry. So I can see that tension just within herself. She's kind of in this torment where. I think it's you good self-awareness too. She should be grateful that she has this healthy baby that's fine, but then why is he putting her through? And he's not put, putting her through it. And I'm sure she, she sounds like she knows that, but human emotions, right? Yeah. Jeremy? I don't know if this is right. I would think when I read that, I think one of the biggest issues is just her understanding of the human condition. God doesn't allow anybody to be, you know, to be sick or to be healthy. All right. Is there a... I'm thinking the tension she would feel knowing that she's going to lose this baby. That's coming no matter what. And the tension is that if I baptize it, I face the reality. I sealed the deal. That's really good. That's very insightful. Tom? Like I mentioned earlier, I don't know what I said now. Uh, the, the issue is obviously losing, losing one, of the, one of the twins, one born healthy and one isn't, but the, the confusion there with mom and dad. Uh, tension, I still, I still wonder if the tension is out there in the family in the room somewhere. I don't know, just this limited knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how to answer some of these things. <clears throat> so, uh, for this issue and tension, is it from the view of the minister? Absolutely. So and you're now the minister. Now you're kind of assessing a little bit. You're trying to assess, like, from your vantage point, whoever shared it. You know, I think this is the attention I see of the situation. And this is, to me, an okay. issue or some issues that are coming up. Their tension or maybe your own tension? Well, no, tensions in the situation and the ministerial oh. things that you would have to be aware of as a minister. It could be something in you. It could be because, you, you know, it's it, if it's in you, well, it could spill over into how you serve them. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so as a minister, you may also feel that that family tension is that a part of the family says, you have to baptize this baby. And maybe she was brought up Catholic, but maybe she just, no, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't know the situation well enough, but as a minister, I would say you're feeling the tension in the room of the two sides that are functioning in a family at this moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, the the tension is, uh, you know, how do I, as a minister, minister to these people that are hurting right now, and to make the situation. The same, better, but not worse. Okay, I'm going to go around and uh, ask about what is the core issue? What's the heart of the matter that's the problem right now from your point of view as being the minister in the room? And I'll start with Tom. Unexpected loss of a child. You're expecting happiness and wonderful experience and you build this blow. All right. Jeff? Hmm. Well, I think, um, I still think there's um, some issues with her relationship with God and also this element of denial of, of the baby. And also, I, I have to, back to my feelings, I'm sorry I can't take them out, but this baby that's alive and well, you know, how is the mother going to perceive that child going forward? That's an issue. With You didn't ask me what my issues were, so I'll tell you. Robert? Mo the mother's anger with God. Okay. It's God's fault. What's there? The baby has to be baptized. The mother's angry, so I think 